This is Michael Altos recording Local Anesthetics, Part 2. Now we're going to speak about side effects of local anesthetics, and we will start with the neurologic side effects. When people start to get high serum levels of local anesthetics, the signs of toxicity usually start with circumoral or tongue numbness, numbness around the lips or the tongue, dizziness, tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears, and occasionally blurred vision. As the toxicity progresses with higher levels of local anesthetic, people start to have changes in consciousness. They become restless or agitated and nervous. They can start to slur their speech and become drowsy and eventually lose consciousness. This will progress to muscle twitching and full-blown seizures, at which point you would want to treat with benzodiazepines in order to stop the seizures. You could use thiopental or propofol, but you should be careful because the patient, as you will see, is about to become hemodynamically unstable, and you don't want to cause too much vasodilation with these potent drugs. So you can use them, just be cautious. Lidocaine it decreases cerebral blood flow, and it minimizes increases in intracranial pressure with intubation. This is the reason that we typically give a stick of lidocaine before we intubate people. It's not for the burning of the propofol. As we saw, that usually doesn't work unless you do a beer block or mix it with the propofol in the syringe. But a stick of lidocaine will decrease the response to intubation. In previous days, people used lidocaine infusions as part of a, local, as part of a general anesthetic. You don't see that very much nowadays, but a lidocaine infusion can actually decrease MAC by up to 40%. Cocaine, as we said before, is unique amongst the local anesthetics because it causes, as you know, euphoria, and it's a drug of abuse. It does cause restlessness, tremors, convulsions, and respiratory failure. Cocaine has a second effect, not just on sodium channels, but it actually inhibits reuptake of norepinephrine, and this causes people to become hypertensive and have some cardiac arrhythmias like ventricular ectopy. They can even have coronary vasospasm. As we said before, topically cocaine is used in the nose as a vasoconstrictor. Local anesthetics can be given into the central nervous system, into the epidural, or into the spinal space. And I just want to speak for a moment about intrathecal or spinal administration of local anesthetics. There are some drugs that aren't commonly used as spinals, and I just want to clarify why that is. Chloroprocaine is a wonderful drug for a very short-acting spinal. It would be ideal for outpatient surgery centers where you need people to have a full recovery so they can ambulate home. There was a time when chloroprocaine spinals were associated with a prolonged neurologic defect, and we found that this was due to not the chloroprocaine, but rather to one of the preservatives in the chloroprocaine. Chloroprocaine is now available preservative-free, and there are centers that do chloroprocaine spinals again. So this would be within normal practice. Lidocaine spinals were also used for short-acting outpatient anesthetics or for very short procedures. And what they found is that some people developed cauda equina syndrome with repeated doses. Uh, this happened with tetracaine too, most commonly when people had a spinal catheter in place and the lidocaine or the tetracaine was infused in. And cauda equina syndrome is uh, damage to the nerves at the very low lumbar and sacral roots. Finally, lidocaine, especially high concentration lidocaine, like 5% lidocaine, was associated with something called TNS, transient neurologic symptoms, which was a harmless but very uncomfortable syndrome that people had slight to severe pain in their buttocks and their legs, and it could last for up to 10 days. And for this reason, you won't see too many people doing high concentration lidocaine spinals anymore. Let's move on to the cardiovascular effects of local anesthetics. It should come as no surprise that since they bind to sodium channels, they will have quite an effect on the normal functioning of the heart's electrical system. 
Indeed, they, de they depress contractility, automaticity, and conduction velocity, so they are cardiac depressants. In fact, if you use IV lidocaine as an injection, you can treat ventricular arrhythmias with it. It can cause some smooth muscle relaxation, leading to hypotension, and at high enough doses, local anesthetics will cause cardiac arrest. The worst culprit is bupivacaine. Bupivacaine has a remarkable affinity for cardiac sodium channels. And a patient who develops local anesthetic systemic toxicity with bupivacaine can be very, very difficult to resuscitate if they go into cardiac arrest. As we said, it can also cause vasodilation. It can inhibit sympathetic reflexes. And this makes patients very difficult to resuscitate. Levobupivacaine, which is a, an isomer of bupivacaine, is less cardiotoxic, and ropivacaine is also considered to be less cardiotoxic. This chart here shows bupivacaine compared with levobupivacaine and ropivacaine, and shows what concentration you need for convulsions, for hypotension, for apnea, and for circulatory collapse. And you see bupivacaine causes these complications at a much lower serum concentration. Everyone should be familiar with the treatment for local anesthetic systemic toxicity. This comes from ASRA, the American Society of Regional Anesthesia. These instructions should be available at, where, uh, at a place where you normally practice regional anesthesia, so on a block cart or an epidural cart. You can also get them online. You can go to lipidrescue.org or just go to ASRA's website. The most important things to be aware of are that when a patient goes into cardiac arrest with local anesthetics, the management is different than normal ACLS. So of course you want to start by getting help. And your initial focus is always on airway management to at least make sure they have 100% oxygen. But remember, these patients are likely to have seizures and we want to stop those seizures preferably with a benzodiazepine. Propofol or, ben or barbiturates could be used, but be very careful because the patient may arrest and have profound cardiovascular instability. The other thing you should do, and this is not intuitive, is find the nearest facility that has cardiopulmonary bypass. Because until we had lipid rescue, this was the only known treatment to keep a patient alive until the one or two hours it would take for the local anesthetic to be metabolized. To manage the cardiac arrhythmias, we generally follow ACLS, ACLS guidelines, bearing in mind that vasopressin and some of our depressant agents may not be effective. Local anesthetics, which are part of ACLS, for example, lidocaine, should certainly not be used in the resuscitation of these patients. And epinephrine has been shown to be less effective in these patients. And while we usually start with a milligram of epinephrine, in these patients we try to use the lowest dose possible. Currently, the mainstay of treatment for local anesthetic toxicity after supportive care is in administration of intralipid. The intralipid should be given as a 1.5 milliliter per kilogram bolus over one minute. Usually that's about 100 milliliters, as fast as you can give it. And then an infusion is started at 0.25 milliliters per kilogram per minute. You can repeat the bolus if necessary once or twice. You can double the infusion rate as needed. And we continue the infusion for at least 10 minutes. In the respiratory system, local anesthetics can decrease hypoxic drive at high doses. And they may also relax bronchial smooth muscle as a possible treatment for bronchospasm. There are some misunderstandings about allergy to local anesthetics. True allergy to local anesthetics is quite rare. When this does occur, it's usually due to an ester local anesthetic more often than an amide. Esters are metabolized to PABA, para-aminobenzoic acid, and this metabolite can be an allergen to certain patients. There are other preservatives which can be a cause of allergic reaction. These include methylparaben, which is also metabolized into PABA, 
and sulfites like sodium bisulfite and metabosulfite, which are often used to prevent degradation of vasopressors like epinephrine. Because of this confusion, it's often recommended that a patient who has had a true allergic reaction to a local anesthetic should receive preservative free local anesthetics in the future. We should also consider some of the other additives in local anesthetics which may have given the patient an adverse reaction. For example, an intravascular injection of epinephrine can cause tachycardia and feelings of anxiety, and an intravascular injection of local anesthetic can cause patients to have anxiety, tinnitus, metallic taste in their mouth, and these toxicities may lead patients to believe that they've had an allergic reaction. Methemoglobinemia is a condition that usually happens with prilocaine or benzocaine. It could happen with lidocaine and with actually a large number of other assorted drugs, but most commonly with prilocaine and benzocaine. When these drugs are given in high concentrations, they can cause the formation of methemoglobin in your body. Methemoglobin is normally present in very small quantities, but when it becomes more than 10% of your total hemoglobin, patients can start to have trouble binding oxygen to their hemoglobin. They'll have shortness of breath and become cyanotic. They can have mental status change and develop headache, fatigue, and dizziness, and even lose consciousness. This is more of an issue in patients who are already anemic or who have other underlying systemic disease like heart or lung disease or sepsis or other abnormalities in their hemoglobin molecules. When met hemoglobin levels become high enough, say more than 50% of total hemoglobin, patients are likely to develop cardiac arrhythmias, seizures, and eventually death. The treatment for met hemoglobinemia is methylene blue. This is a chart I have reproduced in your notes showing different agents and their trade and generic names, different methods of administration, and concentrations that are commonly available, the maximum dose, and typical duration of action. Note that some of these drugs have two maximum doses, one without epinephrine and one with. And this underscores what we said before, that adding epinephrine to a local anesthetic solution causes vasoconstriction and slows the systemic absorption of anesthetic. You should certainly know the maximum doses for bupivacaine, lidocaine, and ropivacaine. And it might not hurt to know cocaine because you may be asked that in a neurosurgery or an ENT room. Before we end, I just want to move back and highlight one other point. When we talk about allergy, some people who claim to have allergy to local anesthetics actually had an adverse reaction because the agent was injected intravascularly, and so they had CNS toxicity, or perhaps they had side effects due to the epinephrine that's mixed with the local anesthetic. And it's important for us to clarify that when a patient claims that they have a local anesthetic allergy. That's it for this week. Let me know if you have any questions, and we'll see you in class.